Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. It is January 22nd, and this is the Vermont Legislature's House Committee on Natural Resources, Fish and Wildlife. And this morning we were talking with the Department of Fish and Wildlife on um, issues concerning wildlife. And this afternoon we have a number of representatives from different um, organizations who work both with the department and on their own on wildlife issues. And so I want to welcome them here. And I am pulling up the agenda myself right now. So um, if the folks who are here, uh, if anyone, does anyone have a reason that they can't stay out for the whole meeting? Because um, we don't have to go in the order on the list, but we can. Um, not seeing anyone indicating a need to leave. So we will welcome Kent McFarland, um, at, from the Vermont Center for Eco Studies as our first witness. Welcome, Mr. McFarlane. Madam Chair, thank you for inviting me. It's great to be here talking about wildlife monitoring that we're doing at the Vermont Center for Eco Studies where I work. Um, just a little bit about myself. I've been studying wildlife in Vermont and beyond for, oh gosh, almost 30 years now. And I've been a, a member of the State Advisory Group for Invertebrates to the Endangered Species Committee since 2003. And I've chaired that for over a decade now. Um, I was involved in both the 2005 and 2015 uh, Vermont Wildlife Action Plans that the state put together uh, with other organizations. And I was given special recognition for my work uh, with endangered species conservation by the Endangered Species Committee in 2016. So, so I'm a naturalist, I'm an outdoor person, a conservationist um, who like a lot of you, I, I love every moment I spend outside experiencing Vermont outdoors and in Vermont's natural heritage. I just, I, it's a treasure. So it's, I'm pleased to be here to speak about it. Um, today, I'm gonna go give you a quick overview of some of the work we do, and I'm gonna share my screen here. There we go. Today, I'm gonna give you a, just a quick overview of some of the work we have done and are doing at the Vermont Center for Eco Studies. And it's often um, in partnership with a lot of other NGOs in the state and out of state. We do a lot of work with Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department. Um, we're partners in many projects and also other federal and state agencies. And of course, we have thousands of volunteers that help us with our projects because um, we believe that to do sound science, we need informed people to help guide and, and, and inspire conservation of wildlife. And so our model is really uniting volunteers and science to get the work done. And we feel like it really succeeds because conservation is a lot more just about ecology. It's also about people. So having people that are really interested in helping discover the science and understand the conservation, we feel like we just get a lot more done and more bang for our buck. Um, our wildlife work is centered in Vermont, but you know, and it takes place from mountaintops, forests and fields, but then we also follow our migrating wildlife down to the Caribbean and sometimes as far as Argentina. Um, and I wanted to just start by talking about two places that seem kind of worlds apart. One technical difficulty, can you still hear me? Uh, we can still hear you, yes. Oh yeah, sorry. Sometimes you're, the uh, computer decides to take your headphones and grab it somewhere else. Thank you. <laughs> so two sort of wildly different places, and one of them really isn't even in Vermont anymore, um, are kind of worlds apart are salt marshes and mountaintops. We've got mountaintops who don't have salt marshes, but they have a lot in common. They're both kind of small, isolated patches of habitat on sort of our big, New England landscape. And they're both really being squeezed by climate change. And they both have these impediments to being able to survive climate change. Salt marshes, they're not growing any higher very quickly. And they're stuck between the ocean and a lot of residential and transportation infrastructure. So they can't migrate when the ocean rises. And well, our mountains and across the Appalachians, they're not exactly getting any higher very quickly. So they're susceptible to climate change and warming trends just going upward in elevation. Through some advanced modeling, one of our biologists, Jason Hill, um, and some of his colleagues, they made a prediction that um, salt marsh sparrows would be extinct in the next 40 years. These are little songbirds that you see in that picture there that nest in the salt marshes on the ground. 
And they estimated the sea level and mean tides are going to get high enough over the next 40 years to make successful nesting impossible. The nest will just get flooded out. And similarly, if we skip over to sort of our neck of the woods in the mountaintops, um, climate and bird distribution models predict that many of our montane breeding birds, they're going to be extirpated from Vermont and probably all of New England as probably by the end of the century as they move northward and upward in elevation. Um, the mountains in the, in the world, they're moving on average twice, they're warming on average twice as fast um, as the world average. And globally, we're seeing distribution of species um, that have shifted into higher elevations recently, 11 meters higher per decade in elevation in the mountains. And they're also shifting to higher latitudes, going further north, about 17 kilometers a decade. So things are moving and they're moving pretty quickly already from climate change. Um, the bottom line is this, for anything we talk about today, um, we have to understand that climate change is going to drive and is driving the distribution and abundance patterns of wildlife populations in New England and beyond right now and well into the next century. So anything we talk about, whether it's land use change, whether it's invasive species, overarching all that, we have to really take into consideration the current and upcoming climate change that's going to be happening. So let's take a look at what we're finding in the mountains here, closer to home, here in New England and Vermont. Um, we have a, a report we put out every year called the State of Mountain Birds, and it's based off of a project we call Mountain Bird Watch. And Mountain Bird Watch um, is a project where we have volunteers that visit every year, they're expert bird watchers, they visit every year in June, these mountaintop survey routes and count birds. And we've done this for, more than almost 20 years now, actually. Um, so we have all this data, all this collected by volunteers and our biologists scattered across the Green Mountains and all the Northeast. And you can go and look at it in more detail, but I'm just gonna give you some quick synopsis of it. One of them, one bird you'll hear all the time if you're up in a place like Mount Mansfield or any of the high elevation peaks, is this little tiny warbler called the Black Pole Warbler. Um, this, we're able to calculate what elevation has the, um, the highest abundance of warblers. It's important to understand that many of these species like the black pole have a strong relationship with elevation and vegetation. This one, this black pole nests in our um, fir forests up around, up above 3000 feet. Um, our analysis of our mountain birdwatch data finds that black pole warblers, as an example, their entire breeding population in the last decade to 15 years has shifted up slope 30 to 80 meters already um, across New England. So they're already moving higher and higher in the mountains from climate change. And eventually they're gonna run out of, uh, out of habitat and they're gonna have to shift northward. The other alarming thing is, is that the population trajectories that we find over the last decade for high elevation birds um, is pretty negative. So here's, here are seven out of the 10 mountain birdwatch species that we monitor. Over the last decade, you can see that all of them have declined. Our state bird, the hermit thrush, has declined the most. Um, Bicknell's thrush, which is some of you may have heard of, it's a conservation concern throughout the world. And it, we ha have about 10% of the population here in Vermont. It has also declined less by only by about 1.1, 1.2%, but still declining. On average, these birds are declining by 5% a year. And I, I sort of like to equate it to, um, you know, 5% doesn't sound like that much a year, but if your retirement account was declining by 5% every year, you would be not pleased. It's, it adds up really quickly. So 5% a year decline. Um, like a lot of these species that we're gonna talk about, not everyone is declining, but seven out of 10 is alarming. Black capped chickadees, um, a habitat generalist, they're actually increasing, increasing drastically in the high elevations. Um, they've moved up slope anywhere from 10 to 100 meters over the last decade, so they're rapidly colonizing higher elevations in the mountains, um, and they're becoming much, much more numerous in these high elevation forests where they were virtually absent just a decade ago. And then two other species that we monitor, boreal chickadees and fox sparrows, they basically have showed no decline or no increase. They're just steady as they go. So out of these 10 species, seven of them, serious decline, one of them a large increase and two of them, you know, they're doing all right. But it's pretty alarming when you have 70% of the species in our high elevation forests are showing such a decline. It just, we just can't have that keep continuing and have these anywhere near us. 
Now, if we take our trip down the mountain a little ways, we have another program called the Vermont Forest Bird Monitoring Program. And um, that's been going on for a long time. And what's interesting about this program is you see the dots scattered all over the map. These are surveys that are also done by expert uh, volunteers as well as some other scientists. And they're done um, during the breeding season in forests that are in sizable forests that are actually mostly unmanaged. So they're not harvested for timber. Um, they don't have any roads in them. They're really large tracks that are relatively unmanaged. And we use this to sort of compare that to other sites that are that Alan Strong will be talking about later today, other sites with a breeding bird survey that uses roadside monitoring. So this is sort of looking at what happens if we don't mess with the forest, how the bird's doing there. So it's kind of a check on these roadside surveys. And we're, we're surveying birds that you know, a lot of you um, here and will recognize scarlet, beautiful birds that migrate here from the south. Scarlet tanagers, black through blue warblers, black burning warblers. I mean, stuff that are just gems in our forest. Um, so in 2013, uh, we started analyzing our first 25 years of data for this project. It came out with the status of forest birds, um, looking at sort of how the population trajectories were going with these. And we're right now updating those. Um, but if you look at this, and I, I don't expect you to digest this right away, but you'll notice there's a lot of reds, a lot of blues, and a lot of blacks. Reds mean the birds are declining, blues mean the birds are increasing, and black means there's really no trend right now. Um, and you'll just notice that there's a big mix amongst all those songbirds in the forest. Some are doing poorly. 13 species are definitely decreasing. Uh, eight species are increasing, and 13 species, yeah, they look like they're doing fine over the last 25 years. There's, there's no trend. You always find, except in the mountain forest where we're seeing a lot of changes, you usually find stuff like this, a mixed bag where there's winners and losers. And that's when we have to dig a little bit deeper into the data um, with this kind of thing. And I'll just show you one example of that in the next slide, which is what we call aerial insectivores. These are birds that feed on insects as they fly through the sky. Um, so they're things that you might recognize like tree swallows and be in your backyard in some of your nest boxes, for example. Uh, could be your Eastern Phoebe or, or wood peewees that you hear. Um, things that wholly rely on aerial insects. They, they sally out and grab these insects out of the air. These things, not only in Vermont, but actually region-wide, and it turns out throughout most of North America, aerial insectivores are drastically declining. Uh, the 25-year trend was a decline of almost 45% decline in these species. Um, and you know, the first question is, what the heck's going on here? Why is it like that? And no one knows for sure, but at the same time that we're seeing this trend with these uh, birds that feed on insects, we're also finding out that there's been, in a lot of places in the world, and including in, with some species in Vermont, there's been a serious decline in insect populations worldwide. And in fact, some of them, people are calling it an insect Armageddon, that, you know, many populations of insects as far as in Puerto Rico and Germany and the United States, all over the world, there's just more and more evidence that certain groups of insects um, are declining rapidly. Um, you know, if it was just black flies, I wouldn't be so sad, but these are things that are uh, that really are the feed of our breadbasket of, of songbirds and other things. Uh, moving a little bit lower down, um, one of the projects where we've worked with uh, with the Fish and Wildlife Department for years on this is our Vermont Loon Conservation Project. It's a great partnership between the two organizations. And back in the 80s, uh, many of you might remember, loons were, honestly, we thought they were going to be extirpated from Vermont. There was, there was only seven nesting pairs in 1983. Um, it was listed as endangered in 1987, and uh, the, the department and, and us and others immediately went to went um, together in making a, a management plan, a recovery plan. We executed that plan together and you can see the results. Uh, it was delisted in 2005 because we reached the plan's goals and we went well beyond them. We've recovered Vermont, Vermont's loons. You can go to lakes in the summer and hear the haunting call of loons. There, there's healthy populations throughout Vermont now. There are even, um, starting to colonize places that we wouldn't imagine they would colonize where there might be a little bit too much boat traffic, mainly because, again, with joint effort, we manage the population really well with signage, um, with education, with work with lake, uh, lake organizations. Um, it's really just been a success story. And it just shows us that if we put our mind to it and a little bit of money to it, we can do really great conservation. And, and loons are a really fine example of that. 
um, where an endangered species law worked and we recovered the species. And, and I think we can do a lot more of that too in the future, um, especially using volunteers as you see here, putting signs out. Volunteers are a great resource to help with this. Um, another way we track loons is our annual Loon Watch Day. Um, and that's the third Saturday of every July where we get as many volunteers as we can to adopt a lake that day and go out and count how many adults and how many baby loons there are on the lake. And just like our, our nesting success, you can see that our, our loon count that's gone goes back to 1983. We've had the same success counting loons. Adult loons are going up really nicely. Um, their sub adults have been bouncing around. Those are the adults that aren't that from the those are adults from young from previous year that aren't quite nesting yet. And the loon chicks are slowly rising up too, the number we count. So it's a great way for us to cover um, very cheaply the entire state of Vermont in one day to get a quick count of how loons are doing. And it's a great way for everyone to, uh, to get out and enjoy loons. So next year, 17th of July. So sign up for a lake and get out there and help us count some loons. It's, it's really fun. Um, another example, getting a little bit lower down, these are sort of in brushlands. Many of you might remember when you were younger, living in Vermont or, or even elsewhere nearby, um, whippoorwills. We used to hear them really regularly, that beautiful haunting whippoorwill, whippoorwill at night um, with a window open out in the edge of the field somewhere or in the brushlands calling. It used, they used to be really quite common in Vermont and frankly all over New England. And uh, their populations have crashed. They've really, really crashed. And so much so that they were listed as threatened in 2011 in Vermont. Um, we have teamed up with, uh, once again, with the, with the department to go out and find the hot spots where whippoorwills are left. So the map is showing us where over the last five years or so, where with volunteers and our biologists like Sarah Carline below, um, going out in the nighttime and doing broadcast surveys and finding out where are the whippoorwills left now. And once we find these hot spots, um, then we can go out and start to do some management and start to do some education and keep these hotspots viable and then maybe start to spread the population back out a little bit more in Vermont. Why did they decline so rapidly? Again, the biggest uh, hypothesis right now is insects again. These things feed on really large moths and moth populations, it is feared, actually is known, these medium to large size moths, their populations have really declined over the last 25 to 30 years. Uh, for a couple of reasons. And just to note, um, it is fun serving whippoorwills, but those little dots around our head, yeah, those are all mosquitoes. So it, it's not without peril when you're out there doing these surveys. And finally, moving down to Valley Bottoms, uh, I'm, I'm sure Alan this afternoon will talk. He's done a lot of grassland work. work. We do uh, some grassland work, but um, we resurveyed a whole bunch of points throughout New England a few years ago that were done in the late 1990s. Um, we, these are all at airports, uh, huge farm fields, uh, right of way areas, anywhere that's, a, that's a type, some type of grassland um, was surveyed during this period. Um, unfortunately, in that period, 1990s compared to 2014, 2015, eight of the nine species were detected at an average of 41% fewer sites including upland sandpiper, it was found at only 4% of the sites where they were previously found. And Eastern Meadowlark, which is probably gonna be listed soon in Vermont as threatened, um, its site occupancy across New England declined by 76%. Um, yeah, bobolinks, there's fewer bobolinks that you might have those in your field. So grassland birds have really taken it on the chin for a variety of reasons. And finally, if uh, one, one project that we have that sort of looks at birds across the entire landscape is it's really turned out to be an amazing project. It's called Vermont eBird. And it is a crowdsource project that takes bird watchers data, collects it all in one spot and allows it to be used for science. So while people are out enjoying bird watching, they're actually helping us monitor birds. It's a win-win. We've done this since uh, 2003 now. We've had over 11,000 bird watchers put data in here. We have um, millions and millions of bird records in here. It's probably the largest database of biodiversity ever collected in Vermont for, for a group of species. Um, we've had, even 2020 was a record year because with, with COVID times, everyone wanted to be outdoors kind of alone. So bird watching was a great thing to do this summer. We had almost 3,000 Vermont eBirders contribute over 100,000 checklists of birds across the state. So 
With this rich data source that we get from bird watchers, um, we're able to now, uh, teaming up with the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology, we're able to now start to get trends across the entire North America, including Vermont. So here's two examples of trend estimates uh, between 2007 and 2016. You'll see wood thrushes, which you hear singing in your wood lots and, and like interior forests. Wood thrushes all over Vermont, in fact, the entire Northeast have declined in every block um, versus something like Eastern Phoebes, which you'll hear in your backyard sometimes, they're, they're actually doing really well in, in Northern New England. They're increasing versus in the center of their populations further south, they're actually decreasing. So we're, we're actually getting more Eastern Phoebes doing better here in Vermont now. So this is a great project because we're able to track lots of bird species with less money and great effort from bird watchers. Well, I wanna skip that. That's actually part of the Vermont Atlas of Life. And I wanna skip for the last 10 minutes or so here, uh, talk a little bit about our huge project of Vermont Atlas of Life. Um, I always ask people how many wild species they think Vermont calls home. And you get crazy guesses. You can get guesses like someone will say, oh, there's probably 5,000 different species that live in Vermont. Uh, some people will guess higher. And the truth is that we actually don't know how many wild species call Vermont home, which to me, in today's age seems pretty shocking that we don't have a list of even what lives in Vermont yet. Um, in 2004, at an invertebrate state advisor group meeting, I asked uh, Dr. Ross Bell, who he was probably one of the greatest entomologists to ever work in Vermont. He was a professor at UVM, um, longstanding member of the invertebrate state advisory group, just an amazing uh, resource. But I asked him, just how many invertebrate species were found here in Vermont, which we were responsible for on the committee. Um, and for each group, he sort of, he literally took a, an envelope out of his pocket and started scribbling tallies for each group of invertebrates on it. Like, oh, I think there's a hundred of these and there's 500 of these kind of beetles. And he's probably the only human that could have done that. And after about 10 minutes, he looked up at me and he said, we have 21,400 invertebrate species in Vermont that we're responsible for advising on. And then he had this kind of dramatic pause and he said, you know, but who the hell really knows? Um, and that really stuck with me at that point, because here I was on this committee, and we didn't even know what species existed, let alone how they were doing. So Vermonters like Ross and Joyce Bell, who spent decades collecting insects in Vermont and others, a lot of people have held up this tradition of documenting biodiversity here. And with our help at BC and others, with the department and others, and great biologists um, like Jim Andrews and others that are on this call, you know, we've completed major statewide atlases of birds, which Alan Strong's gonna talk about later this afternoon. Butterfly atlases, we did a bumblebee atlas. Uh, Jim's gonna sure talk about reptiles and amphibians, which he works on and we help with that. Um, you know, we've had these great efforts and they're worthy efforts, but they're a fraction of the state's natural heritage. We know there's 389 bird species, there's 58 mammals that we once had. We've got 1,585 native plants. Uh, vascular plants, we've got like 400 mosses, et cetera, et cetera. We've got something like maybe 22,000 invertebrates, let's say. So how many species do we have in Vermont? You know, the guess is something like 39,900 species is what I put it at right now. But again, I'm gonna echo what, what Dr. Bell said, we really still do not know how many species live in Vermont. Um, and you'd think that would only happen in a place like Panama or somewhere like that. Um, so, for many of these groups, not only do we not know what's here, but we don't have a reliable assessment of their distribution, or, and of course, not even a close reliable assessment of their population trends. And so I focused on birds at first because we're really good with birds and we need to keep staying that way, but there's a lot of other groups that we just have very little data about what's going on with them. So one of our keystone efforts for understanding what lives here or has lived here and where they are and what their conservation status is and how maybe their population is gonna do is one of our projects is to mobilize primary, primary biodiversity data. So this is like, these are records that document species occurrences in time and space. So it's that someone reported, you know, a ruby-throated hummingbird at their bird feeder uh, uh, at this certain day, at this certain time, at this certain location. That's actually really important data. And you add up millions and millions of those records and it gets to be much more important. These data are the foundation of conservation biology, ecology, and really, it's, they help our, us understand our place here in Vermont and beyond. Um, they, they help us tell our story. 
Um, so we've launched this ambitious project that allows anyone to help gather and explore vast amounts of data on biodiversity across the Green Mountain State. We, we call it the Vermont House of Life. It's a library of knowledge of Vermont's animals, plants, fungi, maybe one day even microorganisms, but who knows? It's online, it's a real-time resource. There's maps, there's photographs, and there's data open for everyone, all of us to use. Scientists, naturalists, citizens, anyone. Um, it's a place where past, present, and future biodiversity data is gonna be stored and is stored and used. Um, and it'll be there forever to be used in a, in, in, in a way that can be used together. And you can see, we started it, we already have 5.2 million biodiversity records from Vermont in here, covering over 10,400 species. So we're well on our way. Um, and we have this thing we call the Vermont uh, Atlas of Life Data Explorer that we just list, uh, leash, released in beta form. And the Data Explorer actually is, um, it's the newest implementation of what's called the Living Atlas platform. It's powerful software that Australia developed, and now it's being implemented by countries around the globe via an open community and network of living atlases. And now the Vermont House of Life is part of that. We're part of that, and it's free, thanks to Australia, and it's amazingly powerful. The Explorer, it offers everyone totally free of use, of course. It's a way to explore right now these 5.2 million records of plants and animals. Um, but it also accesses an ever-growing statewide biodiversity database. I mean, we're just, we're including millions of new records every year now. Um, it's a collaborative, open, digital platform um, that we hope will come from multiple sources, uh, making it accessible and reusable to everyone. Um, and it allows for data downloads, online, online mapping, analytical tools, um, data collection and aggregation. It's really we're really hoping it's gonna be uh, the place for us to really start to understand um, our biodiversity. Um, and as, as we st start to profoundly alter sort of the map of life locally in Vermont, we already are, and, and especially on global scales, you know, we need this knowledge. We need all this kind of knowledge so we can do proper management, understand what's going on, what, who's doing well and who's not doing well in our biodiversity world. And over the next year, um, we'll be adding easy to use biodiversity data dashboards, sort of like the COVID dashboards you've seen. So you, we can just instantly go in and check how we're doing with biodiversity live off the data that's being inputted. Um, and we'll be working on a state of the Vermont biodiversity report just to allow us to see what we know now and where we need to go in the future for more knowledge and, and um, so we can conserve and manage these. The other thing that this project does is it allows everyone to submit observations. Scientists submit observations a certain way, but it also allows everyone, anyone from grade school kids to retired people to submit data while they're out hiking, while they're out bird watching. I mentioned Vermont eBird, that's one of them, but the other big project is iNaturalist. It has a, um, a free app, smartphone app on a robust website where we collect data um, from common species to super rare species from Vermonters of all walks of life and allows everyone to help us understand biodiversity. I'll tell you a, a quick little story about iNaturalist and how it works. Dale Furland is a, was, was fly fishing on the Black River one day and he's not a dragonfly expert at all. He's just a, a, a guy that likes to be in the outdoors and he saw this beautiful dragonfly on that rock. He took a picture of it and it ended up in, in our project iNaturalist. And he said, dragonfly, I don't know what it is. Well, Brian Pfeiffer, who's on the Endangered Species Committee and on our SAG committee, and he's a dragonfly expert. He's always on iNaturalist looking at dragonflies. He immediately saw that dragonfly and said, that is a super rare first state record tiger spike tail, never been seen in Vermont before. Where, where have you seen it? And he, look, and he talks to Dale and Dale shows him on the map where he saw it. Well, Brian knows that this species is a really interesting one in that unusually it likes woodland seeps. Fitting to Vermont, it's a species that breeds and seeps under the canopy of hardwood forests. So he takes a few people down to Springfield, gets landowner permission, finds this thing breeding in three different watersheds in Springfield. This species, easy to conserve, just be a little careful when we're harvesting around the seeps, which we already do when we're doing good wild, uh, woodland management. And we had no idea it was here, and it's one of the top conservation concern species in the entire Northeast. So. All of this because a citizen was enjoying wildlife and posted on iNaturalist. So having people out there doing this kind of stuff is really, really great. 
We also have a lot of other projects on our atlas. Um, I just threw a smattering up here. We've done butterfly atlases. Uh, we're on a moth atlas. We just digitized 50 years of cricket, grasshopper, and katydid data that Dr. Bell had in his files so that we could now um, help figure out which ones are of conservation concern. You know, who doesn't want to have crickets singing in August? I certainly want to have that. Uh, we've done bumblebee atlases. I'm just going to quickly touch on a few of these. Um, again, and all these are with citizen science help. The bumblebee atlas we did really started because um, there was worldwide cry about bumblebee decline. And so we went and looked at, you can see that historic map. Most of the dots on that historic map are from collections in the UVM natural history collection. And just a quick word about that. The collections at UVM are an absolute treasure and should never be lost. And unfortunately, I got a report that over the years, for decades, either the upper administration of UVM has either ignored the collections at best or have actually been detrimental to them by moving them into different buildings or not giving them any, any money to keep the collections uh, safe. And so we really need to pressure uh, uh, UVM to start doing a better job with these plant and animal collections that are a treasure trove of understanding historically what has happened like with, with bumblebees and in the future, um, with collections. And we can do much more than just look at these, 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 these samples and dead insects. There's DNA samples that we can take into these things and use for science. Uh, with bees, you can even scrape them and find out what flowers they were visiting 100 years ago compared to now and understand how that's changed. There's just a treasure trove in that collection and it just really needs to be taken care of a lot better. Um, there's, a lot, there's, there's a lot of professors and students doing that, but they, they really need more support from higher up. Well, that said, we went into collections and identified every single bumblebee that was collected over the last 100 years and got thousands of bumblebees into a database. We went out and did the same kind of surveys across the entire state. And unfortunately, what we found is that half of the bumblebee species had drastically declined and four or five of them had literally disappeared from Vermont that used to be really common um, around the state. And that's led to three of them being listed in the state, one of them federally, and another one is up for listing right now and will likely be listed this summer also. Um, and so these are the workhorses of pollination for us, for blueberries, for apples, for all kinds of things. And we have had seen a massive decline in these. And thanks to uh, digitizing old data and going out and, and researching now, we know what has happened and we got to do something about it. We did the same thing with butterflies, which enabled us to figure out which ones were of greatest conservation need for the department. And all this kind of work allows us to give um, state ranks to these with the department, uh, figure out which ones need to be listed or not and have uh, action plans for them. And of course, we, we help develop wildlife action plans with this kind of data. So just from wildlife atlasing to action plans, it, it's really great to have that data to be able to make the right decisions, the right choices about these things. And right now we're, we're working on more, we're working on a wild bee survey right now um, believe it or not, we didn't really know how many wild bees even exist in Vermont. If you ask how many people, how many species there are, they think, you know, one. <laughs> We're up to 301 wild bee species in the state, and there probably is 350. And these are all pollinators. Um, we've, we've discovered 37 new species in the last year. Um, and 13 of those are introduced non-native bees, some of which we had no idea were here, and in other states, they are actually competing with some of the mason bees that are very important for uh, pollinating apple trees, for example. So, you know, we're, we're, we're discovering some of these introduced species we might have to take care of too. And lady beetles, who doesn't love lady beetles? The same thing, we digitized old data from the UVM collection. At least a third of the lady beetle species, not including the introduced one that you find in your house that everyone hates, the native ones, a third of the native of species have disappeared over the last 35 to 40 years in Vermont. Um, some of these are now uh, protected in New York. Uh, one is federally listed in Canada. Um, and they found some new recent populations of some of these missing lady beetles in New York and they're starting to reintroduce them. And we hope that our atlas will, will be able to take action like that also. But we don't, we're not just talking about Vermont. We also uh, share all our data to the whole world through what's called the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. We can't live here in a bubble. Um, we're, we're affected by things uh, far away too. As some of our work at VC, I'll, I'll end here, shows, um, we've tracked little black pole warblers from the top of Mount Mansfield to the mountains of Venezuela where they winter. 
um, using tiny little transmitters. We've tagged monarchs and tracked them from Vermont the whole way down to the, the mountains of Mexico. Um, we've tracked upland sandpipers down to the shores of, uh, of the rivers in the Amazon. Um, and I've even tracked migratory dragonflies from Vermont the whole way down into the Caribbean. So we don't live in a little bubble here in Vermont. We can take care of Vermont as well as, 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 well as we're doing and even better. But to do that really well, we're gonna have to go outside of our borders. And we've done that at VC, and I know the department does that too. We need to work with other states. We need to work with other countries. So we've worked on plans for Bicknell's Stretch, for example, with seven different countries. Uh, we came up with a, a, action, a action plan for conservation. Same with bobolinks. We've worked with bobolinks and tracked them through Venezuela, the whole way to Argentina. And we made an action plan with all those countries on how we might start to conserve bobolinks. So I'll just end it there as saying that, you know, it's, I love Vermont. We do a really a considerably good job here with conservation so far, and we could do better in some areas, but we can't stop here in Vermont. We have to also think about, about the world we belong to and our connections to all these other places uh, via migration of, of some of our treasured wildlife. And with that, I thank you, and I'll take any questions if I have time. Thank you. Um, you know, I um, think we might have to hold on questions because we did add a, a witness to this afternoon's agenda. Um, so we have three more witnesses to hear this afternoon, and we have a new tradition of taking a five minute break um, about every 45 minutes or hour. So I think we're gonna hold questions. Hopefully you could stay with us, Mr. McFarland, and um, we will resume in five minutes with um, Jim Andrews. Thanks. Sounds great, thank you. So whenever you are ready, Jim, we are ready to hear from you. All right, great. Um, I think I was put to shame by, by Kent in that I didn't put any visuals together for you. I, I did send you my notes and um, I hope you get an opportunity to look at those notes or if I don't cover something in the notes, feel free to get in touch with me uh, directly or perhaps at the end of my presentation. Um, so uh, my background really started in Millbury College as a graduate student and then I continued there as a, as a research scientist and, a, and then a research scholar and then I moved my office home in 2008. So I've been working largely independently um, of Middlebury. Uh, but at about that same time, or actually a little bit before then, I started teaching at UVM and I taught herpetology there until uh, just last year, 2019. Actually, I felt a, a little fortunate that I happened to end just at the time when we had to start teaching remotely because boy, it would be no fun to teach field courses remotely. Um, I've been chair of the Reptile and Amphibian Scientific Advisory Group, um, which feels like forever for 27 years. So I'm uh, one of the three senior members that's been involved with the Endangered Species Committee and the Scientific Advisory Groups. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And I've been coordinator of the Vermont Reptile and Amphibian Atlas since 1994. Um, we started kind of in the same position that, that uh, Kent said he's in now and that we didn't have a complete species list back in 1994. We couldn't tell you exactly the species that we had in Vermont. And, and even now, uh, there's a couple additional species that we, that we may soon call uh, Vermont fauna. Um, because we are finding a few of a couple of new species. So, so we're sitting at about 40 species as opposed to the, you know, out of the total 39,000 that, uh, that Kent's talking about, the relatively few reptiles and amphibians. But, but we started this reptile and amphibian atlas project, much like some of the projects that, that VCE has done, uh, in that we tried to get everybody involved uh, that was interested in getting out and taking photos of what they have seen uh, under their wood pile in their backyard while driving the roads uh, and send us pictures and, and give us an idea of, of what species we had in Vermont and some data on which we could base the conservation needs 
and status of those species. And so since 1994, we've collected over, over 100,000 uh, records of reptiles and amphibians around the state. And we're starting to get a much better picture of their distribution and abundance and, and some of the threats um, that they face. Um, I wanna, if you're following my notes, I'm gonna skip down a little bit uh, and talk specifically about some of our reptiles and amphibians. We have reptiles and amphibians are turtles, in case you're, you know, it's been a while since you've been in junior high or high school, it's turtles, snakes, one lizard, salamanders and frogs. And they have some unique traits that make them particularly sus susceptible uh, in one in, in that they can't fly. Um, you know, they have to move along the ground surface. And so we have created barriers for their movement in roads and curbs and uh, well, window wells and things like this that make it difficult for them to move around uh, across large parking lots or large areas of, of impermeable surfaces or uh, drop inlets on roads that, that these critters fall down into and then and they get stuck in there and die. So there's, there's all kinds of additional um, threats to these species that you would not see uh, in some of the other species that are faster and more mobile and that can fly and can travel uh, around the landscape. They also, um, almost all of them require multiple habitats uh, th that they have to travel between um, in a period of, of a year. So let's say a, a spotted salamander is overwintering in the hardwoods uh, up in your maple stand and then they come out of the ground in the spring and they, they have to move to a breeding pool. Uh, then after the breeding pool where they lay their eggs, the young uh, have to go through their larval stage and then emerge and then go back up into the woods and feed and then find a place to overwinter. So they have to move across the landscape in order to survive. They need a mosaic of, of interconnected wetlands and they need to move safely between them. Um, they also have uh, permeable skin so that anything, uh, amphibians I should say, have permeable skin, not the reptiles, so that anything that gets in the water can go through their skin and end up in their blood. Uh, it's so that they're not as waterproof as we are uh, or, or a reptile or a mammal. And so the toxins can get in them. They don't have to eat them. They can get right through their skin. So they make um, excellent environmental indicators and, and we've often used them as such. Like most species, the largest threats are uh, habitat loss. Um, as you may know, some of the figures that you might have heard, um, we lose, uh, well, if you look at the period between 1997 and 2007, um, we developed 75 square miles of Vermont that we built on, built houses on, built roads on, built parking lots on. And um, even the more conservative, now that was back some years ago, even the more conservative habitat uh, estimations for loss now for significant wild habitat um, would put us at maybe, uh, let's say 23 square miles per decade of significant wildlife habitat that we lose. About 1500 acres per year and, and, and about let's say 35% of our wetlands since European settlement and two to 400 acres of, of wetlands every year. And so clearly, um, when you think about Vermont being a, a finite area, and if we consume that amount of the wildlife habitat each year, then clearly we're going to lose populations until we deal with this loss of habitat. Now, it's not just loss of habitat, but it's also fragmentation of habitat, where we, um, where let's say uh, 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 the spotted salamander um, needs to get from its wintering habitat to its breeding habitat, but has to, has to cross 22A or Route 7 or Route 100 in order to do that. Um, now with, with a bobcat or a deer, they could get across that road relatively quickly, even though clearly some get hit. But the data uh, show that where we have, once the uh, 
traffic density reaches a certain point, populations near roads disappear because they can no longer produce as many young as are killed uh, trying to cross those roads. Um, so habitat fragmentation is probably the second most common problem. Habitat loss, fragmentation, and lastly, I would put uh, in the category degradation. Uh, in that case, we would include um, many of the toxins that we're putting into the environment, uh, climate change, um, introduce the introduction of new predators, uh, the introduction of new diseases um, that we didn't have. So um, those three threats are uh, the primary threats, though I will mention a couple others uh, as we go through uh, some of the species. Um, for example, collection, and a few of these species are collected, even though it's illegal to collect them, there's a price on them. And so there's a black market for collection and sale and, and our game wardens have arrested some people multiple times um, that uh, were not bright enough to realize they shouldn't try to sell stuff online. Um, but they get good money for it and uh, some of these people can do uh, quite a bit of damage. And then I have a group, of course, my snakes uh, that uh, are not always well liked by um, the people that own the land and, and uh, live in the houses next door. And so persecution, direct persecution is, is sometimes an issue where people just uh, kill species or, or run over snapping turtles. Um, so out of the 40 species of, of reptiles, amphibians that, that we're using as our baseline uh, number, 19 of them or 48% are considered uh, medium or high priority species of, of conservation need. And I assume most of you guys have heard that technology species of greatest conservation need. It's a, it's a, it's a conservation threat listing that all, it was an exercise that all the states had to do uh, in order to try to get um, prioritize federal funds coming in, into the state. So we have, uh, 48%, I mean, that's a really high, uh, really, to me, a scary percentage that, that we're concerned about. Eight of those, or 20% of our species, are listed as threatened or endangered in Vermont. Uh, one of them is the, uh, the boreal chorus frog, um, which I know most of you would not even have had the opportunity to ever see. It was only found in northwestern Vermont, Grand Isle, and Franklin County. And we were on the edge of its range. It's being nor more northerly and westerly, but uh, that species just plain disappeared. And, and we haven't seen that species since 1999. The last one to, to see that was fish and wildlife biologist, uh, Mark Ferguson back then. So we assume that species is gone. And sadly, we don't know why that species disappeared, which, which bothers me. I really would, would like to at least have an idea of, of what happened to that species, but we, we don't. The Canadians, who also lost the species, are, are starting a reintroduction program, and we've been talking with them, and, and, and uh, we may be able to cooperate with them, but um, a sad situation for the, for the boreal course frog. There's a North American racer, uh, which is not the snake that most of us uh, that grew up in Vermont um, are familiar with. This is a big snake. I mean, we're used to two-foot snakes or two-and-a-half-foot snakes, and this one gets up to about six feet. Uh, it's fast, uh, it's nervous, um, but we haven't seen a racer in Vermont since 2014. Now here's another one, this is edge of range in that it was um, Wyndham County, most of Wyndham County that had this species. And um, in recent years, it's been Guilford and Vernon and I assume that we still have some of these guys in that one population, that one at risk population that we have down there. And one, one of the threats for racers is, is that being a big, um, a big snake and an active snake, they cover a lot of territory. And so they may travel in a period of a week or two, let's say two or three miles and trying to find a block of appropriate habitat that's two or three miles long 
that they can safely traverse. Now, in this particular case, they're right along Interstate 91. 91 is on one side of them. And then over on the other side is the Connecticut River. Um, and so, and they also are a species that, that, um, that likes a lot of open habitat. And so they actually benefit from power lines and they will use the edge of the interstate, uh, that habitat, but boy, that's a risky habitat for them to be moving around in, as you know. Um, uh, in cooperation with Fish and Wildlife, we spent some time studying the North American racer a number of years ago, and um, we had uh, transmitters in two of those snakes, and, and uh, one of the snakes was taken by a predator. I think it's a, a red-tailed hawk that had figured out where most of these snakes were. Uh, we saw that hawk flying away with some snakes. And, and then another snake was, was run over by a four wheel drive uh, vehicle in a log road. Um, so anyhow, um, I'm hoping that we still have some, some of the species left in that one corner of the state, uh, but don't know that for sure. Fowler's toad, um, not found in Vermont since 2007. This is a really quite a different sort of habitat demand that this species has in that it likes disturbed soils, sands, and gravels along rivers that flood. And my guess is that we have controlled the Connecticut River, and, and for good reason, but we've controlled it enough so that we don't have those raging floods that deposit sand and gravel on these lower fields. Uh, along the riversides, and so we have less habitat for this particular species than we once did. Um, so I, I assume again with this one that we have some limited numbers here, but it's been a while since we've seen it. Uh, and it's just this one population in Vernon that, that we know of that we have left. Spotted turtle, um, we do have current records and we have one population that looks um, that looks, um, Matt, would you get that? We have one population that looks like it's uh, fairly strong in Addison County um, and two other populations that are uh, definitely at risk. Um, uh, spotted turtle likes wetlands. It travels around in extensive wetlands, but it also uses uh, adjacent uplands or adjacent woodlands and um, this is kind of a conservation problem in, in that um, a lot of our conservation efforts have focused on wetlands, let's say, and protect wetlands, but may not protect the adjacent woodlands or uplands that are around it. And so um, for some of these species, we have to make sure that not only do we protect the wetland, but that we protect all the rest of the habitat nearby and allow the species to travel to that habitat and from that habitat safely. Um, spiny softshell turtle, um, luckily we have somebody in Fish and Wildlife who's really shown an interest, uh, Steve Perrin in uh, spiny softshell turtle. Um, it is, uh, uh, again, edge of range. It's only found in Vermont in, uh, in the north, northern end of Lake Champlain. And, um, we have current records. Uh, we have two populations uh, that, that we're aware of. It's unlikely that we have any other. We would have had a third historically that would have been associated with the Delta of the Winooski River. Uh, but now um, we've lost that population, but we have two remaining populations, one associated with the Delta of the Lamoille and one with the Delta of the Massisquoi. And uh, Steve's putting in a lot of work there, uh, trying to maintain nesting habitat because they've, we've lost a lot of the nesting habitat, which is beaches um, uh, along the edges of, of, or near these deltas where these, uh, these spiny soft shows lay their eggs. And so uh, a lot of, uh, a large percentage of the shoreline has been developed or rip wrapped or changed or altered in some way, or it's heavily used by humans. Um, Jim, so I'm gonna, I got, I'm gonna t at, take a little time out and I'm yep. looking, I'm, I'm cheating a little looking at your notes and I wanna make sure we get to some of the bigger picture policy recommendation kind of things. Yeah, there's a lot of that have. I can skip to, yeah. 
teed up, that would be really helpful, I think, for us as we're thinking about um, how to plan our work. Okay, well, let me go up to, um, I know Alan's gonna talk some about the Endangered Species Committee, uh, but I, I should jump in there. Um, the Endangered Species is set up so that it has, um, the Endangered Species Committee uh, gives advice to the Secretary of the Agency of Natural Resources, and it's just advice, it's non-binding. Um, but in turn, the Endangered Species Committee gets advice from the scientific advisory groups. And the scientific advisory groups, uh, I think are tremendously important. Um, we have one for each taxonomic group. So we have one for invertebrates and birds and one for fish. And, and uh, I chair the, the scientific advisory group for reptiles and amphibians. And these, these groups meet two or three times a year. Um, we also provide information directly to, to fish and wildlife uh, when they request it. Um, I think that these guys are essential, these groups are essential in that they are independent of government and fish and wildlife and state agencies. And, and, and I say that because um, while most of our advice is followed through on, um, there are times when there are uh, politics or, or state policies that uh, will override uh, the species advice that we give. And so I think it's really nice that we have these independent scientific uh, groups uh, made up of in a lot of academics, but, but also um, informed, uh, say, with the bird group, there could be a lot of um, non-professional uh, uh, birders that, that really have quite a bit of useful information that, that they can provide. Um, the SAGs are independent in that they choose their own chairs and they solicit and recommend their own members. Um, our advice is, is almost entirely uh, followed up on by the Endangered Species Committee. And Alan will talk to you more about how that's structured. And then they pass their advice on to the secretary. And a uh, great majority of the time, like I said, they follow through, but sometimes politics will get in the way or, or um, some policies that, that override uh, our advice and, and uh, it, it disappears. They hear it, but they don't follow through on it. So I think there's a real advantage to these SAGs and, and the independence of these SAGs so that they can really um, speak their minds and provide the science uh, freely. Uh, I will say that, um, you know, when we provide advice to the, to the secretary, she will turn around and then ask her staff what they think about our advice. And um, in a few occasions where it's a hot political issue, um, the advice will get filtered out as it works its way uh, up through Fish and Wildlife so that she doesn't actually get the advice of the people working in the field. She gets the advice of the appointees and the uh, policy people a little bit further up. And I can understand that, but I think that's one of the benefits of, the scientific, of independent scientific advisor groups is that they can feel free to provide that information. The secretary is at least gonna hear it, whether or not she follows up on it or not, that's a different issue. Um, speaking of fish and wildlife, um, I would say that al although fish and wildlife has come a, a long way uh, toward paying attention to uh, non-game species and putting attention into bats and, and some attention into uh, some of these bird species, um, still personnel, time and money are still heavily skewed toward game species. And as you've heard Ken say, most of the species are not game species and, and Fish and Wildlife has a mission statement uh, in which they have responsibility for all species. And, and although we've made progress there, um, there's still gaps and there, there's still a, a, a bias toward uh, time and energy and money for the game species. Um, there's been limited uh, ability or expertise sometimes, uh, say with, let's say with beetles or moths or snakes, 
that that's uh, within fish and wildlife. Um, uh, just last year was the first time we got somebody on board fish and wildlife that actually has a background in in, uh, in snakes, Luke Groff now. Um, so they're working in that direction, but there's still a, a, a lot more expertise that they need. And the scientific advisory groups do help provide some of that information. Um, Funding and personnel. I mean, I've listened to these guys uh, for the last 27 years and worked with them for the last 27 years. And uh, they are just getting spread thinner and thinner. Uh, their responsibilities have expanded with, with Act 250, with endangered species. Um, and the funding and the, the staffing has not increased at the same rate as as their responsibilities have. Um, as you may know, I don't know if Steve told you uh, earlier today, he's gonna retire uh, in the spring and it looks like they're not, they don't have the money, Fish and Wildlife doesn't have the money to replace his position. Instead, they're gonna to try to spread it over a number of other people and I think that's really unfortunate. Um, I think Fish and Wildlife needs a, a dedicated uh, threatened and endangered species staff person. Steve has done most of that for the last 20 years, uh, but I think that uh, we really need somebody within Fish and Wildlife that could uh, really take the lead there as, in addition to a non-game coordinator, additional staff for Act 250 review, additional expertise and staff in invertebrates and plants, particularly invertebrates and plants because they're really the big groups. And I think they need to develop a wider funding base um, Still a great deal of their funding comes from um, uh, hunting and fishing, uh, traditional recreational activities, federal and state. And uh, although they've, they've expanded their constituent base some, I think there's a huge group of wildlife watchers out there. Uh, plus, when you get right down to it, we're talking about healthy working ecosystems and, and we all should be invested in healthy working exo ecosystems. And I think we, we should all be funding it uh, somehow, either uh, through the general fund or through taxation. Um, in terms of long-term prospects for wildlife, continued habitat loss, fragmentation and degradation will continue to bring about the loss of wildlife populations. Now we're, we're talking a lot about species and species disappearing, but there is no question that we're losing populations. Let's say common species like wood frogs and spotted salamanders and uh, pickerel frogs. We're losing populations all the time through development. What, we're, what we spend a lot of time looking at is when we actually lose species, but those species which are most dependent upon the most unusual habitat types like sand plains and old fields and low pH pools, those are the species that are gonna disappear first and be most threatened. Those that can survive pretty well in, in mixed hardwoods, they're gonna last the longest, but we really have to be addressing habitat loss, fragmentation and degradation if we wanna maintain these healthy uh, working ecosystems. Um, the environmental damage, sadly, we're listening uh, too much to traditional economists and we have to really be listening to ecological economists uh, people like John Erickson, people like the folks at the Gund Institute, we're fortunate to have them at, at UVM. So a lot of environmental damage comes as a result of economic activities that, um, sure, they generate jobs and they generate funds, but they can also do a fair amount of damage. Not that they couldn't happen without that, but we don't really have the built-in controls in our economic system that uh, controls or reflects that, that damage. It, and so there's lots of externalities in our economic system. There's lots of things that are not accounted for. There's lots of environmental damage that takes place at the same time as that money is made. And, and we have to figure out how to put those, what are currently externalities back into our economic system. And, and really it's ecological economists that, that can help us with that. Um, and although nobody likes to say it, uh, we need to stabilize our human population size. And I'm not just talking about that in Vermont, but in the world. 
uh, we have to be doing everything we can to stabilize human population size. And that does not mean tell people how many kids they have. It is only education and, and uh, uh, availability of family planning resources and people will choose whatever family size they want, but they need to have that available. And I think we should say publicly that um, at some point we do have to stabilize our population. I mean, you could try to turn Vermont into New York City, but do we wanna be that? And could we be that? And would we have working ecosystems if we did? We have to address um, one, population, and two, the resource use per capita, which is sometimes just written as, as affluence, uh, so that we can get our, our these, these negative impacts on habitat down to a level where uh, the ecosystem can not only support us, but all the other species. And there, there is a, a frequently referred to equation, which is the IPAT equation that some of you may have heard of, that I equals PAT, the, the negative impact of um, our activities can be roughly calculated by looking at the number of people times the affluence of the people. And by this, we're saying that uh, we have a lot more impact on our environment. We take up a lot more space. We drive more cars. We create more waste. We create more toxins. We have a lot more impact on our environment than a Maasai, say, has. So uh, population times affluence times technology. And we've worked a lot on technology in terms of uh, try to figure out how to get more crops out of a given field or, or how to have renewable resources. And that's all great stuff and important stuff. But the other two parts of the equation we don't talk about, population and resource use per person. We have to, we have to stabilize both, we can't. The idea that we can have a continually growing population, and I'm hearing a lot of media people talk about this these days where, geez, Vermont needs, uh, needs to bring in more young people. Well, if you look around the world, population is stabilizing in Germany and England. It's not just Vermont, it's all developed countries and it's stabilizing because of birth rate. People have always left this state. My, my sister worked overseas, my brother moved to Seattle. But what's different? What's different now is that we have a lower birth rate. The people that are here are having fewer kids. And so population is stabilizing, which is a great thing in terms of wildlife. So we'll still have space for snowshoeing and hunting and fishing and all the recreational activities that people want. We'll, st we'll still have fully working ecosystems, but we gotta look at those other two parts of the equation and we're not doing it. We gotta talk about, there's certainly issues that come about when population stabilizes like schools, school funding, social security, but population stabilization is a good thing. It's what we need. And um, it is what is gonna allow us to have all the resources and the attractions, natural resource attractions that we've had uh, over the years. So Amy, I think I've covered my notes. Great. Thank you, Jim. You've given us a lot to think about. All right. <laughs> that was awesome. Um, we do have two more witnesses. So let's just take a quick break, walk around, shake it out, get a drink of water and, um, Come back in in five minutes, and we'll we'll pick back up again. Okay, thank you. All right, um, is Bill Kirkpatrick here? Oh, there's Alan. All right. Um, so we are getting a little tight on time, Alan. I'm sorry to report that. So um, if you can um, cut cut to the highlights, that would be really helpful. Yeah, happy to do that. Um, Thank you. And uh, I guess um, I guess what I'll say, maybe just as a, you know, sort of a brief introduction. Um, I I uh, my name is Alan Strong. I work in the Rubenstein School at uh, at UVM, and uh, I'm. I teach in the Wildlife and Fisheries Biology program, and I guess relevant to this um, particular 
hearing, I chair the, the State Endangered Species Committee and uh, also am an avian ecologist. So a lot of the work that I do has to do with bird conservation and, um, and, and uh, bird, uh, you know, understanding threats to bird populations. So um, I, I guess I won't spend a, a lot of time talking about, um, you know, the Endangered Species Committee in, in a lot of detail. Um, a couple things that I think are worth noting is that uh, the Endangered Species Committee really is, um, is, is the group that provides advice to the Secretary of the Agency of Natural Resources, both in terms of uh, species that should be designated or listed as threatened or endangered, as well as um, making recommendations about permits that might be issued for an incidental take. And the probably the most important thing that is probably is worth mentioning with respect to the current um, Endangered Species Act, the one that was most recently updated in 2016, is the fact that we now, in addition to protecting animals and plants individually, we also have protection for their habitat. So there is now uh, an opportunity to also designate critical habitat for um, threatened and endangered species. And we're in the process really of trying to kind of feel how that is gonna work out. We have at this point, probably I think about 10 um, proposals for new listings, some delistings, some uplistings from endangered to threatened, but also three proposals for listing of critical habitat for the common tern, nesting islands in Lake Champlain, some nesting beaches for the spiny softshell turtle, and then also one of the uh, major bat caves, a uh, hibernacula in uh, near Dorset. And so we're really kind of interested to see how those are gonna work out because those would, um, in addition to protecting the species themselves, would protect their habitat. So um, kind of a important addition that happened in the 2016 update of the Endangered Species Act. Um, I think just in just in terms of um, the makeup of the Endangered Species Committee, we have six members that are from the public, and so we have um, expertise in in flora, in fauna, in agriculture, and then three representatives from uh, one from Forest Parks and Rec, one from uh, Agency of Agriculture, and then another from Fish and Wildlife. So there's nine members in total on the committee. And a lot of the work that we do kind of comes to us from what are called scientific advisory groups. So there's six scientific advisory groups, um, each representing different taxa. So there's a flora, scientific advisory bird group, birds, mammals, invertebrates, um, fish and one more. Um, and, um, and so a lot of the impetus for proposals for listing or expertise that might, um, that we might need in terms of trying to decide whether or not a permit should be issued for an incidental take comes from those scientific advisory groups. And those are made of, of experts both um, in state, but also some of the scientific advisory groups also have folks from out of state who are just really um, well versed in some of the issues with respect to these um, rare, threatened, and endangered um, species of plants and animals. So those are, you know, in some ways, kind of the engines that are driving a lot of the work that we do in the Endangered Species Committee. Um, a proposal for listing or, or um, some uh, some constraints that might be put on an incidental take permit come to us from the scientific advisory groups and we're the ones that can make a decision and provide the final advice to the secretary. Um, I provided a um, I provided a slide if you got um, I guess my handout that just went through some of the um, current listing in terms of the number of species that are listed either as threatened or endangered in Vermont. If you have a copy of that, you probably saw that um, by far it's dominated by plants and plants probably compared to fish and wildlife are just easier to count 
um, easier to census. They don't move around. So, and, and we also have some really fantastic botanists in the state of Vermont. So we have really good information on um, populations of some of these endangered and threatened plants. Um, and then, you know, from there, probably, um, I would say that the information on invertebrates is probably lacking to some degree, just because we don't have really good information on uh, population status of um, some of these species, especially of uh, insects. And you probably heard a little bit more about that from, uh, from Kent McFarland earlier. We have really good information on birds. Um, you'll hear a little bit more about mammals from uh, Professor Kilpatrick, you probably heard some from Jim Andrews on reptiles and amphibians. So, you know, when you go from taxa to taxa, there are definitely different challenges in terms of understanding population sizes and how best to census them. Um, but birds, we do have some really nice data on. So um, that's, been, um, that's been really helpful in terms of both the scientific advisory group being able to kind of understand um, how big the population is and what sort of threats we might have, as well as um, understanding more regionally how their populations are faring. Uh, generally, in terms of listing, when we're thinking about whether or not to characterize or to nominate a species for endangered or threatened status, um, we're really looking at, um, at three different criteria. So um, a low or de declining population size, um, a limited number of subpopulations, so they maybe only be found in two or three different places in the state, and then um, a known or suspected threat to the population's viability. And so that, that piece has really been important because we've had a number of species, or we do have a number of species in Vermont that are they're just rare. They, we just don't have that many of them, but they've seemed to be at low population sizes um, as far back as we have recorded data. So those are not the species we're really interested in listing as threatened or endangered. We're really interested in those ones where we can pinpoint a threat to the population. Um, you know, whether that's something that's um, specifically due to human-induced factors, anthropogenic factors, or whether we're seeing, you know, other threats that, you know, may have to do with, you know, natural cycles or, um, you know, changes in predator-prey dynamics, something like that. Um, uh, in terms of some of the current issues for the Endangered Species Committee, um, we are really interested in this critical habitat designation and how well that's going to work. We took the three species I listed earlier, common tern, the, the bat cave, and the spiny softshell nesting beaches. We kind of took those as kind of low-hanging fruit for, you know, sort of easy test cases. A lot of the land is either already protected or they're willing landowners who are really interested in the conservation of those species. And so we're just not really sure when we get to species that may have a distribution that includes a lot more private land as to whether or not that's something that we can actually get enacted. So these are kind of a test case to just see how well we have, you know, how, whether or not this is going to work in terms of being able to actually designate critical habitat. Um, it's really a powerful tool in terms of protecting species, but whether or not it's um, whether or not it's something that can be used on a lot of different species, we're just not really sure at this point. So something that we're really interested to see how well we can make that work going forward. I think two other issues that are sort of weighing on the minds of the Endangered Species Committee right now, um, a couple of them just have to do with issues of uncertainty. So not necessarily having perfect information either in understanding, you know, one, what is the population size? How many individuals do we have a particular species? And then number two, um, how widespread is a particular threat to a species? And it's just a challenge when you've got species that have, um, that are rare, um, that have uneven distributions, um, and oftentimes have to just use your best scientific judgment in terms of understanding what those threats are. So, um, and then finally, we have been dealing with some uh, 
some issues of pesticides, both with respect to mosquito control as well as lamprey control. And those are a couple issues that um, just have continued to be challenging in terms of trying to figure out what are um, kind of the best ways to um, manage these nuisance populations while minimizing the effects on endangered species. And so those are a couple, those are some of the issues that we're, we're kind of struggling with right now with the, um, on the Endangered Species Committee. Um, I will, let's see, um, maybe I'll just stop there. Um, Representative Sheldon asked um, for me to present um, just maybe a little bit information on bird populations and how we understand bird population trends in Vermont. But maybe before I go any further, I'll just ask if there's questions specifically about the Endangered Species Committee or the work that we do. Um, I think we, we're in the in the interest of time, it would be really good to just we're going to have questions at the end. Okay, and so mm -hmm. um, and if you so if you can condense this down and then we'll hear from Bill and then we'll have questions. That would be awesome. Okay. All right. Well, let me uh, what I'll, I'm going to if I can find it here. I'll just share my screen for uh, these last few slides. Um, you all see that. Yes, we can see. Okay, it. great. So um, we have basically um, really five sets of um, five places where we get data for bird populations in the state. And I think that Kent McFarland probably talked to you about a couple of these um, Vermont Center for Eco Vermont Center for Eco Studies Mountain Bird Watch and also their Forest um, Bird Monitoring Program. And also um, Vermont Center for Eco Studies, as, as well as other groups around the state, do a number of kind of species or habitat specific studies um, that go on looking at, you know, particular species in particular places and have helped to answer some questions about population size and trends. The two I was going to mention um, and spend a little bit of time introducing you to, one is the U.S. Geological Survey's Breeding Bird Survey. And the second one is the Vermont um, Breeding Bird Atlas. So the Breeding Bird Survey is something that's been um, going on now for 50 years. And it's really uh, just kind of an amazing data source. And I won't go into a lot of detail about um, how you can use those data, but if you want the, um, if you have the copy of the PDF of this presentation that Breeding Bird Survey is a hot link and you can go on there and, and play around with data and take a look at it. And if uh, you ever want some more information on how to interpret that, I'd be happy to do it. Um, the data are all collected by volunteers and they all have to go through a training program to really um, assure that they can identify birds by, by sight and by sound. And essentially they're done by, um, by routes. So it's 25 mile routes and each route has 50 different points. And at each point, the observer stops and counts everything, all the birds uh, they see or hear for three minutes. And those data are aggregated. And so you can see this map shows where those breeding bird survey routes are throughout um, North America. And you know, it, as many maps do, this one stops at Mexico, but there are um, sites in Mexico and Central America as well. And it's just a tremendous source of data in terms of understanding the, um, the trends of different species and their populations and how that varies geographically. And so we know a lot, a lot of what we know about bird population trends have to do with this uh, National Breeding Bird Survey. The second one is uh, the Breeding Bird Atlas. And so as opposed to the Breeding Bird Survey, which is really looking at abundance, the Breeding Bird Atlas is looking at changes in distribution. And so we have two time periods where again, volunteers spent five years going out and documenting the distribution of breeding birds throughout the state of Vermont. And so um, each, um, the state was divided up into random blocks and these kind of light gray um, squares that you can see on the map of Vermont were all the places that were surveyed. And so in this particular case, the yellow-bellied flycatcher, the red dots represent places where 25 years ago they were found but weren't found 25 years later. 
The blues are where they've actually popped up. They weren't there 25 years ago and now have come back. And the gray are areas where they were found in both of those atlases. And so we've got amazing data in terms of changes in bird distribution over this 25 year period. And this is something that's really helpful when you can look at this on an individual species basis. But one of the things that we can actually do is take a look at that and kind of aggregate it by habitat type. So what I've done here for this particular slide is the x-axis are the different kind of habitats or groups of species in the state. The red of those histograms indicates the plate, the sort of number of individual species that have showed a decrease in distribution. The yellow is ones that have stayed the same and the green are species that have actually shown an increase in distribution. And so you can see here that there are, you know, particular places where we were actually, you know, not doing particularly well in conserving birds. So the aerial insectivores is a group of birds that feed uh, by catching insects out of the air. Their populations have declined very generally. Um, the boreal species and the high elevation spruce fir species, so the species that are found in the Northeast Kingdom or up at the, on the mountaintops, not doing particularly well. And then also some other ones, um, you know, are showing some sort of mixed results. Grassland birds not doing particularly well, shrub and interior forest kind of a 50-50, some few increasing, some decreasing, and um, you know, an sort of unexplained, but um, owls are not doing particularly well with a chain, uh, de decrease for most species in terms of their uh, distribution um, in Vermont. So these are some of the data that you can get from that, um, that second breeding bird atlas in terms of understanding how populations or distributions of populations have changed over a 25 year interval. So that was the last slide I had. So I'll, uh, I'll stop sharing and uh, can pass the pass the torch to uh, Professor Kilpatrick. Thank you. That was very helpful. Um, Professor Kilpatrick, are you available? You have appeared. <laughs> oh, I think he's muted. I think you're muted, Professor Kilpatrick. Um. We still can't hear you. I'm wondering if you have a bad connection. Maybe you could turn your video off and try talking. Well, <clears throat> we can't hear you at all. I'm sorry to report. Um, I think... <clears throat> you were in the meeting twice, but now I only see you once, I think. Um, Nope, you're in twice. I'm wondering if you're on the muted device by any chance. All right, well, we are not able to hear you, Mr. Kilpatrick. I don't know, Amanda, if you can help him behind the scenes. Um, in the meantime, I think I will look to the other presenters and just see if members have questions for the presenters we've heard from so far. I guess I was, oh, <laughs> I was gonna start, but I'll let Representative McCullough kick it off. Go ahead, Jim. So, so it's not a question, but it's a comment, you know, for the committee. Uh, we heard about the amazing success of the loons recovery. Your committee on uh, natural fish and wildlife some number of years ago um, banned lead 
um, sinkers for fishing. What the loons, the bottom feeder. So that was a part of it. I'm done. Thanks. Um, I'm going to ask, it's a general question. I'm not sure who's best suited to answer it, but um, it seems like in my time in Vermont and as a professional working here in natural resources, you know, we've, we've made strong statements about what we think we know about certain species, and then they seem to have kind of upended it. And so when I see these graphs of 50 years of bird data, which is exciting on the one hand, it's still a very human scale. And so I guess I'm wondering how you as, as scientists and monitors um, put this in context of could this just, the, the declines and the increases, are they natural variation? Are they, we just, we don't really know because we haven't been watching that long. Um, how do you kind of wrap your heads around that? Does anyone? Um, I'll talk. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, sure. I mean, if you go back far enough, if, if you go back 12,000 years, you know, when we were all covered by ice, um, none of these critters were here and they all had to work their way gradually into the, into Vermont and the Champlain Basin. Some came from the north, some came from the south, but, um, but, um, but um, the rate at which we are seeing declines right now, I do right not now. believe is normal. And I think it is, uh, is a result of human activity. I'll add a couple of things. So, um, you know, if you take that 50 year time frame and, and, and yes, I think it's a, you know, I think you're perfectly correct in saying it's kind of a, a human scale interval. Probably the biggest drivers that, that we see for many of these populations are land use change. So um, changes in agriculture, changes in, you know, maturation of forest, um, changes in development patterns, whether that's forest fragmentation or, or kind of new developments. And um, I think you could explain a lot of the changes in distribution of our wildlife based on those. And then I think when you've got other, um, other species that require digging a little bit deeper, Kent could probably mention you know, some of the invertebrates, but you know, if I went back to that, um, the aerial insectivores, just thinking about you know, some of the things that we do in terms of main, you know, keeping down insect populations, whether that's um, just for, you know, whether that's for agriculture, whether that's for, um, uh, you know, just feeling good when you walk outside. Um, those are, um, those are things that take a little bit more digging to figure out exactly what the challenge is on those. And, you know, when you take a, you know, you put, you combine a, a whole set of birds that are dependent on insects in the air, and you can combine that with, you know, many species of uh, invertebrates that are declining. Um, it's probably not just going to be land use change that's driving that. It's probably going to be other, um, you know, sort of fine scale features as well. Yeah, it's a, a really good point. I just add that, you know, monitoring is the first step. And it, to me, it's like the flag raising. It's like, wow, there's an interesting pattern here. And the second step then is to find out like, okay, is this, you know, as you, uh, as you mentioned, Representative Sheldon, is this natural? Is this a short term thing? Or is there something we can peg it on like Alan and Jim are, are suggesting? And so for me, it's a two step full, uh, two step process. It's monitor, raise the flag, do some action and figure out what's going on behind what you're seeing. Um, and that just takes a lot, that takes time and it takes a lot of effort, but, and it keeps me up at night think, wondering, you know, what's going on with some of these, some of these trajectories for sure. Thank you. Other questions? Representative Dolan. Good afternoon on this uh, late afternoon on, on Friday. Uh, I really enjoyed all these presentations. It, it gave me a sense of awe in terms of the breadth of work that is ahead of us, the breadth of species 
that perhaps are some are declining and some are, as you mentioned, uh, we haven't found in recent years. Uh, the species pertaining to insects, to plants, to birds, to other wildlife, uh, amphibians and, and the like. And um, I really struggle with, um, with how do we, what would be your recommendations in terms of how we can best prepare the state of Vermont for um, these 21st century type of challenges, whether it be habitat loss or, or climate change or, um, or the, um, you know, the breadth of impacts that you described. We need to have a science-based approach across the spectrum here. And we really look to your recommendations and how we're going to accomplish a science-based approach to handle these challenges. Uh, yeah, great, deep question. And, um, I, you know, I think that there's some advances in monitoring that are going on that are enabling us to um, keep track of populations remotely that don't necessarily require the same amount of people power that we've needed in the past. Um, automatic recording devices that we can place out in the field and keep track of bird sounds or amphibian calls. Um, you know, other ways that we can um, that we can monitor remotely. Um, I, you know, the other thing I guess I would also say, and you know love to hear Jim and Kent's response to this is, I, you know, I do think that we, we know a lot and there's a lot of, you know, I think sort of common sense um, initiatives that we can take that will, um, you know, that will help us better understand or predict population changes. You know, I think, um, you know, as we're starting to, you know, think much more deeply about forest fragmentation. I mean, we have a tremendous body of literature on the effects of forest fragmentation on wildlife populations. And so it, you know, it doesn't, um, I think in terms of, you know, moving ahead smartly with a science-based um, approach, we shouldn't be thinking about reinventing the wheel every time a problem comes up and being able to say, let's, you know, let's take a look at what we've got in the literature. Let's take a look at some of the results that have been maybe done in, you know, nearby states or things like that. And we can apply those to some of the problems here. So I think, I think, you know, both in terms of being able to be more efficient in our monitoring, but also understanding that we have a lot of science and a lot of good information to, to rely on without having to, you know, sort of start from scratch. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that 100% Alan and, and, you know, acting on our science you know, we do, we and everyone has done a lot of great science and we got to act on it. Um, we can't just publish the paper. We got to, we got to act on it and do something. And, and that's why I was thrilled to be invited today, to be honest with you, because this is the start of acting on it. Um, and, and we also have to understand that when we act on it, um, some of the things that we act on, there's synergistic effects too. A, a, a really great series of papers just came out last week concerning the decline of insects worldwide and the lead paper, I think the title was something like death by a thousand cuts. And it was really an interesting article about, you know, it doesn't take rocket science to figure out what's going on with insect decline in the world. It's all kinds of stuff. It's not just, you can't just point your finger at one thing. It's not just climate change. It's not just land use change. It's not just insecticides. It's like everything death by a thousand cuts. And so when we're working on wildlife populations, I mean, we got to think about that with all this stuff that it's everything is sort of a, a synergistic effect on the on, on something else. And so if we're working on one subject, we're trying to do something with climate change, we're trying to do something with land use, all those things can add up to help wildlife populations. So we really have to think big um, to the point where it's scary. It's a little bit scary, actually, but it's a sign of our times that we We've got to act in a bit in big ways, I think. So I would say that, you know, in, in addition to trying to address the issues of individual species like the loons and the lead sinkers and stuff, we have to be looking at some of the bigger picture 
issues that will save many species as a result. And so addressing habitat loss, addressing habitat fragmentation, uh, trying to figure out, I mean, if we could have an, an, an we get rid of all traditional economists and replace them all with ecological economists that have some training in ecology and realize what the impacts are of some of the things that they're promoting. Uh, and, and I'll get back to it. And, and you know, size of the, the human population and the amount of resources that we use per person, uh, getting those externalities back into our economic system so that our economic system can can help uh, control and slow down some of the damage that's taking place. Um, in my mind, we we could trace most of this back to to human population and resource use per capita. And so trying to figure out uh, how to deal with those things and still maintain a sustainable economy in safe ways is what we got to do as well as working on the individual species. We got to deal with some of the big picture issues, the, the big drivers. All right, um, I think Bill Kirkpatrick is on the phone. Um, we have a couple minutes, Bill. You've, I don't know if you've had a chance to hear some of the questions. I think in, in lieu of trying to do a presentation today, um, if you wanna weigh in on sort of the policy topics that have come up, that would be great. But we, we try to finish up by three o'clock on Fridays. So I'm sorry to um, have tried, I think I overpacked the agenda here, but um, if you have uh, anything to add, we'd love to hear it. Oh, still can't hear Bill. Uh, I think he's muted on the phone. Ah, technology at its best. Um, try, try this. <laughs> Okay, it sounds like you have two devices on though, so if you could turn right, off the speaker. Right, let me turn off the one. Right. Sorry, just a second. It's like you're on the, out in space. How's that? Is that better? That is better, yes. Yeah, I, I just would like to comment. I thought I thought uh, Alan did a really good job of of identifying what I see as our real problem. Um, our problem is basically we can generally never have enough information to really know about the current trends of populations, whether they're going up, they're going down, or whether they're remaining stable, um, and. You know, in, in the case of mammals, where I think we've done really good jobs uh, for conservation, uh, like with with uh, the curtailment of wind turbines, but uh, that has resulted in a loss of collection of data uh, by designing uh, uh, fisher traps that won't trap martens, and that has eliminated most of our input of information about the current status of American martens. So both of those ways, the conservation really has affected the loss of our, of our sources of obtaining population data. The other thing that, that I, I would like to say that usually we're based with some idea of trying to determine the, the extent of the threat that occurs to these uh, particular organisms. And that, I think, uh, um, some of us feel re rather frustrated uh, because we think we should be taking a very conservative approach to try to protect these species where the agency of, of natural resources in many cases seems to be wanting data that, about the extent of the threat that's really not likely obtainable uh, in, in a reasonable period of time. And with that, I know it's late afternoon, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, I'm going to ask you, though, could you be... Uh... What, what are those particular species that you're talking about? 
need the, that the, the, the concerning the threats. Yeah. Well, I, I think there's 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 two. I I in addition to being the chair of the the mammal SAG, I also serve on the herb SAG, so I've been uh, involved a lot with the lamprosite treatment and its impact on mud puppies. So mm-hmm. that's certainly a situation. Uh, we have a lot of data that says there's extreme uh, threat to the continued existence of mud puppies. I've done some genetic work that shows the mud puppy populations in the Lamoille River and what used to be in the Winooski River uh, is a very unique population that doesn't occur in the rest of Vermont. I think, as Alan mentioned then, we've been infected with uh, recently uh, by uh, discussions of other insecticides or pesticides, in this case for mosquito control and how it might be impacting uh, listed bat species. Mm. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all for being here with us today. This was most edifying. And um, we will continue to explore kind of current issues in wildlife on Tuesday afternoon after the governor's budget address. So um, stay tuned. We're going to, I think we'll move on for Friday afternoon. But thank you so much. It was really great to meet you all and have you join us. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. If there's any Thank ever you. any questions, please contact us anytime. All right. Thanks, Thanks so much. We will. All right, committee. I think Thank that's you. a wrap for the week. And thanks for um, a good week and sticking with it. As always, feel free to be in touch with me um, if you have questions or concerns. And have a great weekend. We will see you again on the floor Tuesday morning.